So welcome back, everybody. And I just want to do a quick sound check. Is the sound okay for people? Yeah, that's super, because I don't have to strain my voice too much. So. Good, I hope you've enjoyed your breakfast and uh, been able to generate some feelings of gratitude and, and kindness and warmth towards your wonderful situation here. And uh, I certainly have had that opportunity by feeling inspired by all of you and your practice and the silence that's developing already uh, on this first morning together. So thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be here. And I'm still slowly landing. I'm not fully oriented yet because I have quite a lot of jet lag from uh, a long trip and actually a flight that was cancelled the day before. So I was supposed to be in the country a whole day earlier, but uh, 24 hours later I was only two, mile, two hours from my hometown. <laughs> but it was also a nice lesson actually in loving kindness because uh, our plane got stuck on the runway. Um, and we got the announcement after about an hour, thinking, why aren't we going anywhere? And, uh, and we were told there's something wrong with the wing, and that the engineers had to come and repair the wing, but then the engineer couldn't come, so the plane had to go to the engineer. And every 20 minutes we got an update to say, oh, they're still working on it. Um, I'm terribly sorry, you could hear the pilot's voice getting more and more fraught and a little bit more dejected each time. First of all, he was a bit, you know, bouncy, but he was, I'm terribly sorry. Thank you so much for your patience, but it could be another 40 minutes. They're still trying to fix the wing. And the lovely thing was that the more these announcements came in, and four hours turned into five hours, <laughs> the people in the plane, including me and on my little row, were getting more and more friendly and actually resorting to humour and sharing our meagre little snacks. And uh, someone in a row a few rows behind got to know that uh, I couldn't eat the snacks because there was a bit of garlic in it. It aggravates my condition. And they offered me their snacks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just really remarkable to see that a group of people who were actually under a significant amount of frustration and concern, worries about you know not getting back in time to look after their kids because their husband was going to work, Still, we could relate to one another with so much care and so much mutual concern and actually looking for little opportunities to support one another. And I thought that was just a lovely testament to what is the general characteristic of human beings. The things that we don't read about in the newspapers, right? The things that don't make it to the news. Because they're so commonplace, we barely actually take note. But if we look for that kindness, we find it's all around us, and it's actually what causes us not only to survive, but to thrive. I mean, we can't survive without love. We wouldn't even come into this world without some amount of loving care you know, in your first days, whether, even if it's not your own parents, the people in the hospital, the people who try and keep you warm and make sure everything's working okay. You know, and obviously people who don't have that loving relationship in their childhood have a much harder time and have a lot of uh, childhood wounds to, to heal. Uh, because we basically are born in love and thrive through love. We need love just to survive. So I wanted to talk a bit today about loving kindness in the way the Buddha described it. Um, which is even more exalted and purified than the ordinary love we experience in the world. There are many types of love we experience in the world, but loving-kindness, as the word metta is translated as, is a kind of benevolent, well-wishing, protective love that is concerned with the safety, the well-being, and also the spiritual flourishing of ourselves and of others, no matter who they are. So it is genuine love, without conditions, without even self-interest or concern. It doesn't make demands on others to be a certain way. It doesn't uh, make expectations that if I'm kind to you, you'll be kind to me back. You know, Even when we practice metta, loving kindness towards a loved person, of course we hope it may give them some benefit, but that is not the reason we practice. We practice to purify our heart so that our hearts become free from hatred and ill will. And we purify that at the really root level, so that there's more love in our hearts and more love in the world as a consequence. 
So we start from somebody easy and we spread it outwards. But before we get too much into that, to speak a little bit more about uh, the nature of love, it's a very ethical kind of love because it's concerned with reducing suffering for oneself and for others and bringing about um, a sense of care and a sense of harmlessness. Yeah? One of the things that my teacher once said to me, which I think is very uh, encapsulates that wish of loving kindness, he said, uh, I'm committed to being kind to you. Which I thought was interesting. Because sometimes we think that love is just a mood or an emotion, something that arises spontaneously. But love is actually something we commit to, something we do, something we practice. In a way, love is a verb. Yeah? Love is something we can create more of in our hearts and in the world. Another thing he said to me is, I'm always on the lookout to see that you're safe and prospering. Always keeping my mind on the lookout. And this is like a mother loves a child. They're always on the lookout, or a father, or any caregiver. You know, we're, we're constantly watching over that person, not in a domineering way, with a lot of space, giving that person freedom, but just checking they're okay. They're safe, they're healthy. If there's anything they need and we can provide it, we're ready to do that. And this is an ongoing commitment to that person's flourishing. Yeah. So it's a very ethical quality. And it includes forgiveness, right? Forgiveness of ourselves as well as others because we're not perfect, life's not perfect. I don't think there's any perfect person in this universe, even going back to the Buddhas. You know, sometimes people think that a Buddha is a perfected person. They're not perfect at the human level. It's just they've rooted those um, long intentions in their heart, the intentions or motivations of greed, hate and delusion. But there'll still be things they do that irritate some. And the Buddha's own cousin tried to kill him by throwing a big boulder down the hill, which splintered off and, and hurt his foot. He made very bad karma because of that, so make sure you don't kick any boulders intentionally at anyone here. But uh, even then, even a Buddha can generate or can be the projection for other people's ill will. So this is always going to be the case. There are always going to be irritations. And we need to forgive those. We need to forgive life, right? Be patient with life, because life is not going to unfold the way you want or as quickly as you want. And the same with our practice. We have to be very patient, very gentle with our minds and trust that just planting the seeds is enough. In fact, that's all we can ever do. We can plant the seeds with the best of intentions in the most fertile soil we can till. But then we have to wait for the time to ripen, for those seeds to start to sprout. Yeah? If we start to pull and tug on those plants, we're going to break them. They're never going to grow. So patience is a very important part of, of loving kindness. And you'll see that mothers and fathers have enormous patience with their little kids who are running around screaming, demanding their attention. And they just respond patiently, quietly, calmly. And I know for any mothers here or fathers, you might think, oh, I do get irritated. That is a fraction of the time, you know, the immense amount of patience that love generates from its own side is really a testament to the strength and the, and the virtue of that love. So it does sometimes involve self-sacrifice. It involves giving, being generous. But one of the practices and, and trainings that we probably are engaged in for our whole lives is to balance our own needs with the needs of others. And I think, generally speaking, if we do take care of others' needs, we're taking care of our own well-being too, because it's a beautiful thing to do. But if we're only doing that at the expense of our well-being, through some kind of um, psychological need, perhaps, you know, sometimes we're socialized. I know, speaking as a woman, I'm socialized to give you know, to make other people happy. And sometimes I can actually forget to ensure my own mind is still in a, in a resourced state. So it is a balance, and we have to balance our own needs, but love is willing to give and go that extra mile. And it's nurtured and nourished by gratitude, right? Those people who we feel gratitude towards, and it can be anyone, even those who are irritators, they're showing us our... Uh, our weak areas, they're giving us the opportunity to develop uh, more loving kindness. We can have gratitude for all the teachers in our lives, you know. 
As a monastic, we often don't have like a teacher that we can associate with as often as we'd like to. And for myself, I have to learn to look at everyone in my environment as a teacher, including the guests that come and stay. You know, what are they teaching me about the way I relate to others, the way that I relate to myself, or give of myself, or where my motivations are, you know? What is it in me that still gets triggered or that still has preference for one kind of person and less of a preference for someone else? So everyone around us can be our teacher if we're humble enough to learn. So for loving kindness, I actually quite like the word love <laughs> because I think the word love is a beautiful word that we've corrupted really through our cravings and attachments and using it far too loosely and um, superficially. You know, we say that we love a hamburger. I know, maybe people here don't eat hamburgers. <laughs> or we love a football team, or, you know, you love a certain colour. And it's okay, I mean, we, we, we've got a preference, we, we've got a liking for that. But that isn't really what love is all about. Love is something so much deeper. And uh, in the Greek philosophy, there are different kinds of love. And I think this is quite interesting, because some of them relate to metta. There's one uh, word, philia, which means like friendly love or friendship love. And for me, friendship love has been very strong and powerful in my life. I think some of the purest relationships I've had have been with friends. You know, my childhood friend who I met at the age of four, we grew up together and uh, traveled to India together. Now she serves on our charitable trust. And she's always given me a sense of unconditional love. This is someone who knows me through and through and still trusts that I'm good enough, that my intentions are good. You know, I'm a fallible human being, but I'm coming from a good place. And she'll always interpret things that happen or that I relate to her in that positive light. Well, knowing you, you know, if you were irritated, it must have been quite challenging. You know, that kind of support. And it doesn't take much work. When we travelled to India at 19, we actually kind of lost each other after three weeks. <laughs> One of the rules that my mum told me was don't go to Kashmir. We actually ended up in Kashmir after five days by accident. And the second one was don't split up from your best friend, but we did by accident again. Um, and we didn't see each other for about a year and a half. But once we met, it was just the same. You know, just the same kind of resonance, understanding, empathy was there. Uh, because that really felt to me like an example of unconditional love. There's another word, zinnia, which means the love one has for guests. And I think in ancient uh, Greece and probably in much of the world today, in the Middle East and yeah, certainly in Asia, there's a lot of hospitality that I think we've lost over in the West, sadly, because there's so much fear and we all live such separate lives, you know, in our nuclear little families or sometimes alone. But in those cultures, there's a very strong tradition of opening your home to a guest who may be hungry or just passing through. And that kind of love is very beautiful, that you're just caring for someone who you don't even know. You don't know their name, perhaps. You know, I read a story about someone traveling through Egypt, and uh, it, it's actually someone who's now a monk. I think it was Egypt or maybe Turkey. And uh, they needed... They just looked scruffy. They were sort of hanging around in the street like a hippie, wearing really mucky clothes. And this lady just took them in and kind of rather gruffly said, shower, there, go, <laughs> put him in the shower. And then took him out, here, clothes, put them on. <laughs> Gave him a whole new set of clothes. And then sat him down and fed him. And then just told him, okay, off you go. And that really stayed with this person for a long, long time as an example of love that really asked nothing in return. She's doing it because there's something to be done. She has the resource to do it. This person needs that shower, that food, and she sends him off looking so much happier and more resourced. And this is a beautiful kind of love. And then also in the Greek philosophy, they have a word called agape, which means unconditional love. And this, I think, is both can be very related. All of these can be very related to metta. But I think this one in particular is what we're aiming for. And if that sounds very lofty and idealistic, don't worry, because all kinds of love, even metta, start as conditional. They start towards the near and dear. In the Metta Sutta, it says, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child. 
So often people think this means that metta is like the love of a mother to a child. And that might be a good example in the beginning, but then it goes on and it says, so to all living beings, one generates those same attitudes, those same feelings to all living beings. Yeah? So this is the difference between conditional love, even in its purest form, in a worldly sense, an unconditional love, which generates those same feelings of care and protection and nurture for a life to all beings. This is really an incredible goal, and it's not a trivial thing. It's not a, some kind of sugar coating or a kind of happy, happy state of mind. This involves a lot of commitment, a lot of courage, and a lot of zeal, right? A lot of feeling of, yeah, we want to generate the energy to do this. And uh, in Buddhism, we have what are called the four idipadas. Have people heard of these? I don't know. I think half of you here probably are quite experienced in, in the practice. So the four idipadas are like the bases of success or the roads to spiritual power, if you like. The highest spiritual power being Nibbana, the attainment of... Uh, the highest happiness, the end of greed, hate, and delusion. And uh, the first of these four is called Chanda. That's not my name, my name is Moon. But Chanda means like zeal or desire, but it's not sensual desire, it's the desire for the Dhamma. It's that longing, I think in everybody's heart here, whether you know how strong it is or not, there's a longing, there's a search, there's a sense that there's something to be realized that's brought you here. And that is chanda, that is the kind of energy, that, the zeal, the enthusiasm that points you towards your goal and keeps you going. And it also generates energy, the second of these uh, four idipadas, virya, which I studied Indian medicine before I ordained because I couldn't find a monastery. <laughs> so I thought, I'll just do that for a while. Um, not quite that simple, but. And in, uh, in Ayurvedic medicine, they also use the word virya to refer to the potency of a medicine. So it's like a potency, it's an energy, it's um, something that can propel you on. Yeah? But it's not the energy of grasping, it's the energy of a hero. And a hero goes into battle ready to lose everything. Yeah? You go in without any self-concern, just because you know this is the right thing to do. So we go into this practice with the energy of letting go, not the energy of attaining. And then also we make the determination, citta idipada is called like mind, which sometimes relates to samadhi, but it can also be a kind of making up your mind to do this, a sense of determination. And again, energy, determination, even the zeal can be a kind of gentle approach. It doesn't have to be like gung-ho, right? That kind of energy burns out very quickly, but it's more of a gentle persistence, not willing to give up. Keep on planting those seeds, just keep on nurturing the seeds, you know, shining on the sunshine, the mindfulness and the kindness, and making sure the soil is nutritious and well aired. So we do this in a persistent and dedicated way, keeping the goal very clearly in mind. And then the last of those uh, four idipadas, bases of success in the practice, is uh, vimamsa, I think. And that is related to wisdom. So it's understanding what you're doing and why you're doing this. And the why in this case is so beautiful. Metta is going to give you a lot of good Goodwill, obviously for others, it's going to bring about a very deep sense of ease and comfort and happiness, contented happiness in your heart. But even more than this, it's going to purify your mind, especially of ill will and fear and the things that block our capacity to love, the things that block our capacity to go into the deep states of stillness in our practice, the five hindrances, and also block our ability to see things as they are. Right? The five hindrances, I guess people might know, I'll just run them through them quickly, like sensual desire, ill will, yeah, anything. It doesn't have to be like outright anger, it can be a sense of boredom, dissatisfaction, general grumpiness, fault finding with yourself or with another person, even just kind of not 
really connecting or engaging with your meditation object. It's a kind of like lethargy of the mind. And then also dullness and lethargy, which is not so much physical tiredness, because many of you might be genuinely tired, but it's that part of the mind that just doesn't want to connect. It, it wants to kind of zone out or dull out because it's just too painful to be with. It's an extension of ill will, if you like. And then restlessness and worry or remorse, that kind of force in the mind that just pushes you away all the time, pushes you away from your object, maybe back into the past, maybe into fantasy realm, you know, anywhere but now. And again, it's a sign of discontent. It's a sign of a subtle ill will that never allows you to stay with what's happening long enough for it to open up, right? And then lastly, the doubt, not really knowing why you're doing it, not really clear about the benefits or the path. And sometimes that can just manifest as a sense of confusion, you know, in the mind, like, okay, I've got an hour, what do I do? I'll start with metta, uh, mm, doesn't seem to be working, maybe I should do it differently. Mm, no, okay, I'm going back to the body scan now. Oh, now I'm feeling the breath, yeah, I'll do a bit of breath meditation. <laughs> I'm glad other people are laughing because this happens to all of us from time to time. And this is a kind of confusion, right? A kind of doubt. Not really, it doesn't enable you to really give things a good chance and just see where they lead. So all of these things are undermined actually by the practice of metta. And one of the reasons for that is obviously it's an antidote to ill will. But also metta brings about a deep sense of contentment. You know, it's easy to stay with the things we like, the things we have kindness and gratitude and a feeling of warmth towards. It's easy to be with a friend, right? It's really easy. Sometimes, you know, you both know that you've got to go and attend to other business, but you can't quite get through the door, you know? It's hard to put the phone down. You, you know, you'd rather stay with that friend. And when we have that attitude to our breath or to our body or, you know, to our loving-kindness meditation, even to the phrases of loving-kindness, then they tend to stay and they start to kind of shimmer in happiness. You know, it's like whatever you look at with loving kindness starts to glow back at you. It starts to respond, if you like, and it actually starts to become beautiful. It appears to your loving eyes as an object worthy of love. So loving kindness and all meditation involves these four idipadas. Yeah? Has my mic just stopped? Yeah? It's flashing. I don't know if we have more batteries now, otherwise I'll speak up, I guess. There's, there's more batteries in where they're on the side where they popped up. Ah, okay. Ah, huh. good job I didn't suck them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite counterintuitive. Okay. So, a, f a bit more about metta before we go too far um, with the Edipadas. I'm aware that I'm probably giving quite a lot of information. Is it, is it too much? Is it okay? It's not too much. That's great. All right, because I get really into this subject and there's a lot to say about metta. <laughs> so, um, with the Adipadas, making that resolution, having the energy, the inspiration, and the dedication, the persistence, is really important. And also, it's important to notice every moment of loving-kindness and really value that. So, loving-kindness, when it's um, developed in full becomes one of the four Brahma Viharas. It can become a beautiful abiding for the mind. And the four Brahma Viharas are equivalent to the four jhanas. These are deep states of samadhi. Um, sometimes people describe them as like union with God or uh, cosmic consciousness in some traditions or um, infinite love, unconditional love. All of these are kind of descriptions of the deep meditative states. They're not actually the end goal of the Buddhist path, but they're very resourcing, nourishing states of mind where the hindrances have been overcome. 
But every step towards that is a step that's going to help you overcome the hindrances and improve your relationships in your life, uh, bring you well-being, bring you ease. And the Buddha said, it's like you're putting drops in a jar. Drop by drop, the jar gets full. The only thing is we can't see the top of the jar. So it's like we've got these huge water pots and uh, every little phase of loving kindness is like a drop. But unfortunately, it's opaque, so you can't see how high the water is. But you can just trust that every single drop you put in is contributing to the whole. And before you know it, one day it will overflow. And this is when metta is considered to be appamana, boundless and immeasurable. It overflows quite literally and becomes measureless in breadth and in scope. Measureless means you don't measure anybody. You don't measure yourself. It, it extends further than the universe. It's boundless. It has no limits. It's also vipulena, abundant, and mahagata, which means the mind goes to greatness. It becomes vast. And, of course, this um, helps to break those boundaries between people. So for this reason, metta is called sima sambeda, which means literally it breaks the boundaries between self and other. It breaks those artificial, superficial divides we put between ourselves and other beings. Not only human beings, but even other beings in different realms, the animal realms. Yeah? So this decreases our um, tendency towards bias or prejudice. You know, it lessens this... Uh, any kind of ism, you know, sexism or genderism or uh, racism, you know, any kind of othering of another person, which causes so much pain. So Metta is known as the great healer. The four Brahma Viharas together are known as the healers, the great healers of the world. And these are the long-term effects we can expect. It's also impartial, so it's like the sun that shines on all beings. You know, it shines the same warmth, the same light on everybody. It's not that the sun's rays say, oh dear, there's a little uh, elder beetle over there which sort of fell on my face in the night. It actually gave me a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> I won't shine on that. <laughs> I had one here as well. Anyway. <laughs> They're very gentle. But anyway, I try to give them loving kindness and keep a peaceful mind. So the sh sun shines impartially on all beings, no matter who they are, and the loving kindness will do that too. It's like it goes beyond the boundaries of beings, so that all beings becomes like a singular thing. Its synonyms are non-ill will, avyapada, and adosa, literally non-ill will. So again, this points to its underlying purpose to remove these things from our hearts, yeah? And other things as well that can keep us away from the full potential of love are, are the fears in our hearts, like the fears, even the shame that we might have, which is a kind of internalized fear or a guilt that we have, you know, a deep sense of unworthiness or um, something being inherently wrong or bad inside us. You know, this is also possible to be healed through loving kindness. And I think one of the most um, important aspects of loving kindness that really uh, brings it to maturity is wisdom. Yeah, wisdom is um, what matures loving kindness. Wisdom starts with an understanding that all beings suffer, right? All beings are subject to disappointment, loss, grief old age, sickness and death. There's nobody who can escape these things. You know, by the very nature of being alive, we're subject to these things. And they can come at the most inopportune times. You know, in the first noble truth, the Buddha said that suffering is just being associated with what we don't like and not being associated with what we like. And also, not having our wishes fulfilled is suffering. How often are our wishes really fulfilled? You know? Even loving kindness, if we say, may you be happy, but you want that person to be happy, then <laughs> your wish is not going to be fulfilled necessarily. So we have these wishes without expectation. And when we understand, you know, that all of us are in the same predicament and the suffering we experience is universal, then this can give rise to a real sense of um, loving kindness and compassion for the world at large. 
And we are one amongst all beings, so we're included in that. We all have a need of love to survive and to thrive, and those people who do inflict a great deal of harm on others probably are people who haven't learned love. You know, imagine a life without love. It's unthinkable. You know, it's uh, at best a kind of mere survival. You know, maybe a rat race, I don't know. So the context of love and kindness in the Noble Eightfold Path is important to understand. And for me, this starts with right view. Right view is the first factor in the path. And the Noble Path is both sequential in a way, in that each factor leads into the next and strengthens the next. But it's also kind of holographic, so after a while each factor starts to contain the others because we develop these qualities um, through our practice almost simultaneously. Like if we really are developing wisdom, then there has to be an element of love. If we're really developing genuine loving kindness, there will be a sense of wisdom guiding it to its appropriateness, to when it turns into something that's kind of a counterfeit of love, kind of sickly or or just bland sentimentality or you know maybe even attachment or sensual desire so we have to have those two together and um, you know in contained in right view is not only an understanding of suffering and its cause but also a, a bit of an understanding at least a preliminary understanding that our actions have effects yeah if we act from a mind of ill will then it's likely to generate a lot of unhappiness, not only for ourselves, but for the person on the receiving end, unless they're a very excellent meditator and can respond with a lot of understanding and forgiveness. You know, and equally, if we act from a loving mind, then we're going to most probably, maybe not straight away, experience positive results from that. So we do have a responsibility to take care about the ethical quality of our intentions, and see that they're aligned with loving kindness. That's one of the right intentions that the Buddha discussed. Avyapada, non-ill will, loving kindness. And also nekama. Nekama means like renunciation or letting go. Sometimes that can feel a little bit dry to people in this society perhaps. Uh, maybe it's the word as well, the translation of that word, but it, it means really a freeing a, um, a giving attitude of the heart rather than a desire to possess or to control. So rather than approaching our meditation in terms of what we can get or what we can attain, what we can tell our friends at the end of the retreat, we approach it in a way that we just want to give to the practice. We just want to give all the best of the quality of our attention, of our mind, of our energy, give our sincerity to the way that we practice. And uh, and develop that contentment. So it's the opposite of desire. And then the other right intention that um, naturally leads on from right view is avihimsaka sankapa, which means non-violence or non-cruelty. It's uh, very similar to the word ahimsa, made popular by Mahatma Gandhi uh, when he um, rose in non-violent protest to the British colonial rule in India. And uh, yeah, he did this through the power of gentleness, of kindness, of, of non-harm. And we can have that same attitude towards our minds when we practice. How much of the time are we, you know, just waiting for something to happen or forcing a little bit too hard or even getting too close to the object, right? We get a bit too close to the breath or too close to the sensations. There's a pain and we want to zap it. You know, how about just giving it a bit of space, just having a very gentle touch? And a lovely um, simile in the suttas for this is like the way that you'd hold a little bird. Um, this actually happened to me in Perth once. A little, uh, what do you call a baby bird? A chicklet? A birdlet? <laughs> it was very fluffy and cute. And it had kind of yellow and white markings like its mummy. Um, but it kind of, I think... When we found it, we thought it had fallen out of the nest, but what it was, I think, is that it had flown out a bit too far and it was too tired to get back. So someone had put it in a little box with some tissue paper around it. And after a while, I noticed it was trying to get out, so I went towards it very gently and tried to see if it would come into my hand, and it came into my hand quite easily. And I remember having one hand underneath it, and it was mainly fluff. 
And I didn't want to actually touch its feathers because they look so delicate. So I just put like my hand like this, sort of around its neck, which was tiny, right? I mean, the fluff was enormous and the bone was really small. And just kind of held it like this in my hand, very gently. And I could feel it relax. And after a while, it got the confidence to just kind of hop up my arm. So I just let go of it, it hopped up my arm. And after a while, it came back and I just held it like that. So it was just enough of a touch to give it a sense there was someone holding it, but not that it was trapped, not that it was stuck. And after a while, I noticed this big bird that looked just like the little one flying across a few times, noticing that we had her little baby and, uh, and wanting it back. And uh, one of the junior monks remembered where these birds lived in a particular bush. So he said, just bring it back to this bush. So I took it back to the bush and very gently let it get onto a, a branch. And no sooner than I'd let it go, the mother was feeding it immediately. Like she came immediately and put food in its mouth. It was so touching, you know, just that um, trust as well that the mother had. Not only that the little bird had in my hand, but even the mother, she could see we were being very gentle and caring with this bird. And I think she probably knew that, you know, we, we would give it back. So this is the kind of approach we have to our practice as well, a very gentle mind. Once I asked my teacher, I said, I think I have quite a lot of kindness, like metta is one of my strengths. Um, letting go, probably not too bad either, but patience and gentleness, this needs work. <laughs> you know, because I'm usually in a bit of a rush, I think it should have gone further than it has or whatever. I said, how, pa how gentle should I be? You know, how, how gentle is appropriate? And he said, be gentler than gentle. <laughs> I thought that was so beautiful, be gentler than gentle. Almost as though your mind or your meditation object doesn't even know you're there. You know, it's there doing its thing and you're just very quietly watching from a little bit of a distance with the eyes of kindness, you know, with the eyes of a mother protecting her child, just watching the meditation object grow and develop, but not interfering, not controlling the process at all. So and this naturally, when we have these three right intentions, they naturally lead to right speech and action. Yeah. The next factors in the Eightfold Path. Because if you have a mind motivated by loving kindness, non-ill will, non-greed, yeah, non-cruelty, letting go, giving, etc., then of course your actions of body and speech are going to follow in that direction. Not perfectly at first, because we're conditioned by our behaviours in the past, and that's okay, but at least we should start seeing more gentleness, more kindness in our actions as well. And that leads into the right effort, as it's called in the Noble Path. Um, sometimes I prefer the word endeavour than effort, because effort can feel a bit too close to force. But really, what we're trying to do there is prevent the unwholesome states coming into our mind and allowing them to leave. Not pushing them out, not forcing them out, but just not feeding those unwholesome states. So this involves wisdom too, to differentiate between a wholesome state and an unwholesome one. And not to feed the weeds, yeah? not to overly entertain them. They can be there in the background, but you just take care of growing the flowers. So the other side of right effort is to nurture the wholesome qualities, to maintain what is there and then to develop it, to allow them to grow. And loving-kindness accomplishes all of this in a very beautiful way because simply by having the thoughts of loving-kindness in our mind, we're keeping out the enemies, we're keeping out those thoughts of ill-will. Even thoughts of sensuality can't really arise when you have loving-kindness, unless you're unskillfully directing it to someone who you have maybe a more complicated or maybe a romantic engagement with. So we choose our objects carefully and we develop those wholesome states that then can lead to the right kind of mindfulness. Because so often we talk about mindfulness as if there's such a thing as bare awareness. Yesterday I made the joke of bare awareness, like a fluffy bear, and it was a kind of joke, but not really. Because there is no such thing as B-A-R-E awareness, as long as the hindrances are still present, distorting the way we're aware. You know, we can't see things as they are, if we're seeing them through lust or if we're seeing them with ill will, we're obviously colouring our experience that way. So loving kindness actually helps to 
um, diminish those hindrances so that we can see things more clearly in a way that will calm and pacify the mind. And that will help us to um, experience deeper samadhi, where the hindrances are fully overcome. So just to end, I wanted to um, speak about a few more of the benefits of loving-kindness so that you're energized and ready to practice. And um, of course, one of the main benefits that the Buddha talks about in the suttas is that one with loving-kindness easily attains samadhi. So, and it's precisely because of the reasons I mentioned just now, because it does help very much in overcoming the hindrances, but also the proximate cause for deep meditation for the samadhi states is happiness and the happiness born of a peaceful mind. And loving kindness is inherently joyful. It's a joyful experience. When you feel loved, you might not be bubbling around with joy, but you'll feel a sense of ease, a sense that the world is okay, that everything's okay, you're okay, the person next to you is okay. You know, things are good enough. In fact, things are pretty good. And the more we can have this perception, the more easeful and relaxed and calm we become. And that's a very pure kind of happiness. I'll go into this much more um, later in the retreat, but I want to talk about these different types of happiness. And the type of happiness that comes through metta is extremely um, resourcing. It's, uh, it creates a sense of spaciousness and softness in the mind. It gives us a kind of courage to be able to sink deeply into these meditative states. And that also cushions the mind when we start to experience the deeper insights. You know, because this is not an easy path. We're actually looking into the truth of suffering and the pervasive nature of that suffering. We're starting to understand that there is no abiding, permanent self inside us, right? This is challenging to the sense of self. If we have quite a, um, not a very healthy sense of self especially, this can be very challenging. But metta, loving kindness, helps us develop a sense, a healthy sense of self and a sense of ease and comfort so that when we do start to let go through the insight practices, we have something there to resource us and to cushion us to those truths, if that makes sense. Yeah? So, as well as this, there are lots of other benefits that you'll start to see during your time here, I hope. And one of those is related to sleep, which you'll be glad to hear. And that is that one with loving kindness goes to sleep easily and has no bad dreams and also wakes up refreshed. So, if that doesn't happen, it doesn't mean you don't have loving kindness. For me, last night, I guess it could have been worse, but I did have a few uh, little elder bugs crawling on me in the night. In fact, they kind of dropped down because there was a net, like a mosquito net, and they were kind of crawling up the side and then they dropped. <laughs> but I managed, they were ever so gentle and I managed to remain peaceful with it because I realised if I start to worry that I'm up and it's, you know, three in the morning or it's like 12 at night, whatever, however many times I woke up, then I will be exhausted. But if I can just remain calm and content with it, that's okay. And I actually ended up going back to sleep and having a dream that they were coming in to my net and they had bought three packs of cards with them. <laughs> I have no idea why, but anyway, I had some strange dreams. <laughs> so they were having fun, anyway. <laughs> so anyway, you won't have bad dreams and this is because, you know, your conscious will be, conscience will be pretty clear. And, um, yeah, loving-kindness relaxes the mind, so you'll sleep really well. The Buddha also says that you'll become dear to human beings, dear to devas. I think that can be extended to animals as well. When I was on a six-month retreat a few years ago, it ended up being a four-month retreat, fairly, but uh, because of some outside disturbance. But uh, I was in complete solitude in a beautiful kuti in the middle of the forest in Western Australia, and uh, my only people to talk to most days were the kangaroos. Yeah. And uh, they used to actually, they stayed a reasonable distance from me. But one time I was coming back to the kuti. The kuti is like the hut, the monastic dwelling in the forest. And uh, I noticed they were quite close. And I thought, well, when I come back, they're going to disperse. So I better walk really, really gently. 
And I noticed that most of them did slowly disperse. They just bounced off a little bit further. But one family who I'd made friends with and even given names, <laughs> they actually came closer. I was amazed. Like I was coming to the hut and they were also coming. And it wasn't about food. And I told my teacher and he said, oh, it's probably because the mother has a little joey, like a little baby in the pouch, and she actually wants to show the joey that this is a safe place. And I noticed that as well when um, the big kangaroos, like in Australia they have mobs, like you call a mob of a kangaroo pack a mob, and they usually have maybe, I don't know, maybe six or seven different females with babies and only one male and everyone runs away from the male. <laughs> so from time to time the male would come and they'd all kind of again run away. But this particular family would come closer to my cootie as if to take shelter and refuge there. It was really, really sweet. So animals become our friends and we become unchallenging, unthreatening to them. It also has benefits for our health, of course. In the suttas it says that we're safe from poisons, weapons and fire. I mean, partly, you don't want to try that out, okay? But <laughs> partly that could be because you also have more metta and wisdom to stay away from those dangers. You know, you're associating with good people. You're less likely to be, you know, in a fight or in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I think it also can point towards the fact that our health improves. You know, maybe we eat something that's not quite right, but our immune system's so strong from all the loving kindness we've been doing. And these things are proven now in modern science that you know, health, uh, Meta does have health benefits. It also has benefits to reduce depression and anxiety and uh, increase our immune system. So, and also, it gives us a radiance. In the suttas it says we get radiant features, but in the modern science, they actually say it can increase gray matter and it can um, have anti-aging effects. So there you go, if that's not enough of a <laughs> motivation for you. <laughs> I don't know what is. And, uh, and then also we die unconfused. We die happily because we've lived our lives happily. You know? And we don't have enemies. We don't have doubts about the path. We know the path to lead to wholesome states. And we can die with love and kindness. So these are just some of the benefits, but I really would like to uh, stop talking and start practicing um, and see if we can just start to generate a little bit more loving kindness in our approach to the practice. I'm thinking it might be good to start with the phrases later on today, uh, in a formal guided meditation at about 2.30. 2 but if some of you are already practicing loving kindness, please feel free to go ahead in whatever way you wish. I'll teach it more formally this afternoon. So for now, we'll just see if we can bring that bit more kindness and care into our practice, whatever we're aware of. So please have a stretch. <laughs> 